Hey everyone, I'm Rick Richards. Welcome to the show. Tonight, we have a special show. We are going to look at the difference between a civil war and a revolution. What are the preconditions? Could COVID-19 kick off a civil war or a revolution in the United States? We're going to take a look and find out. Now, remember, I do not advocate for a revolution or civil war. I do not advocate for violence of any sort. We are simply looking and strategically analyzing which scenario is more likely to happen. See you on the other side. All right, all right, all right. Welcome aboard, everybody. It is April 11th, uh, 2020, a holiday weekend, Easter weekend, Easter Saturday, as a matter of fact, and I am staring out of my isolation chamber at sunny skies, but not really anywhere to go because of our uh, lockdown situation, which is kind of tough. It is a day off, but I decided to work because, man, what else are you going to do, right? So welcome aboard, everybody. Um, we're going to jump into the show pretty quickly. First, a few shout outs. Uh, shout out to Kim, Tammy, Tanya, Jixer. Uh, Jixer's in line to win the toilet paper. We'll see. Terry McLean, Dwayne, Charlene, Chad, Steve. Uh, who am I forgetting? Julia, of course, Julia. Producer Dave and Odell. I'm not going to forget you guys, man. Producer Dave and Odell. Special friend of the show, Lisa, and anybody else that wants to uh, drop by. We are picking up a lot of subscribers, a lot of views, and kind of a heavy subject uh, for the weekend. But you know what? If you're feeling a little bit more um, contemplative, maybe, and a little, um, a little bit more in the mood for a deep dive, that's what we're doing today. We are going to examine whether there is a possibility of either a revolution or a civil war in the United States of America, and which is more likely? Is a revolution uh, more likely or a civil war? And today we are going to be looking at preconditions for a revolution. So before we do that, we are gonna go through our updates, find out what is happening in the world, and then we'll get into the deeper dive issue. That's what's happening around the world and in Canada. And what do we see, right? What do we see? We see a um, we see a degrading of the situation. We see a degrading of basic human decency. We see more of a more of self-serving actions, self-preservation, and I think that's to be expected. Anytime that you see a rapid deterioration in a situation, you also see a corresponding uh, deterioration in society or the communities ability to support one another. Because you know what, people, as complex as people can be, they are very rational creatures as well. And they very quickly start thinking, what's best for me? What's best for me? How do I survive or prosper in this situation? And I did a video a while ago uh, that got quite a bit of attention on civil unrest, not civil war, civil unrest. And by the way, I do not condone civil war or revolution. I do not advocate for it. I do not want it to happen. I in no way want it or in no way do I advocate any sort of violent reaction at all. I am simply examining conditions and trying to strategically analyze which events or series of events is more likely to occur. That's it. Okay. So let's get into it. These kind of situations um, in many ways are, of course, catastrophic, and they can trigger violent changes, right? Whether you agree, disagree, advocate, don't advocate, I clearly do not. Um, but let's see. Let's, let's take a look at what could happen. And today we are going to look at uh, revolution or civil war. Which is more likely? I mean, these are both sort of a, um, a violent insurrection or uh, armed conflict within a country or region, and they um, they both tend to come about in similar kind of situations, but they are different. So we're going to look at which is more likely to happen in the United States and why. So, revolution or civil war. 
Revolution. What is revolution? Revolution is the forcible overthrow of a government, ruling class, or social order. Some revolutions from the past that you may be familiar with are the American Revolution of 1776, and that was a revolution based on um, taxation, representation, and unified more or less through geography. You had a colony that was thousands of miles away from their rulers, and uh, they felt that they were being unfairly taxed and had no representation and wanted to, um, over, um, wanted to overthrow that rule and establish their own uh, society, which made sense because there is you know, a great deal of distance between the two, between Great Britain and uh, the US colonies at that time. 1789, we had the French Revolution. And the French Revolution was um, unified by the working class, poor people, you could say, uh, overthrowing the monarchy. They had grown dissatisfied with the, um, they were probably inspired by the American Revolution, had grown dissatisfied by the monarchy and the treatment, their treatment under the monarchy. And that was, uh, of course, triggered a violent revolution, which led to Napoleon. The Haitian Revolution, many people don't realize, uh, Haiti was uh, at one time called Hispaniola, and it was the richest, richest colony in uh, the Western Hemisphere. They produced uh, sugar, among other things, for France at the time. And that was a revolution. The Haitian Revolution was a revolution unified by race. Um, so the largely, the, well, the majority, the, the black majority, were the formed the underclass, and they were ruled by a white minority and a um, a mixed race, another small mixed race minority that were involved as well, and that was a, an extremely violent revolution. They killed all of the their white rulers, um, and also the uh, mixed race people as well. Shortly thereafter, and um, from their perspective, it was a successful revolution and uh, also very violent, but that was, we've seen three different unifying factors. There has to be a, a, a major, most important component of a revolution is a, a almost a monolithic unifying factor. So in Haiti, Haiti it was uh, uh, unified through race, France through class, and America through geography. Um, the Russian Revolution was another one that was largely class-driven um, or ideologically driven, and this involved people overthrowing the monarchy, the czar, and uh, establishing uh, communism. So it was an ideological revolution, and um, it was also very, very violent, and that was in 1917, and that uh, heralded the beginning of the USSR, which lasted until another kind of smaller revolution in 1991 that overthrew them and established separate republics. But that's another story. We won't get into that just now. And finally, I included South Africa. South Africa could be considered the only, um, or well, one of the, one of the few soft revolutions in that you had a large uh, underclass governed by a small uh, white minority and they overturned that power structure through nonviolent means um, more or less. I mean there has been, there were sporadic periodic um, um, periods of violence that continue to this day. There's a lot of um, farm violence and stuff like that but by and large it was mostly done um, through media, embargoes, sanctions, um, voting, all those sorts of things. And they, they overturned that power structure. It was based um, on race and ethnicity. And, um, and that was the South Africa revolution, we could call that. <clears throat> civil war. So a civil war is war between citizens of a country. American Civil War of 1861 pitted the North Union States against the South Confederate States. Spanish Civil War of 1936, and the American Civil War was driven largely by um, uh, eth or, um, monetary considerations, economic considerations, 
you had a largely agrarian society in the South that also depended heavily on slavery and a largely industrialized um, um, uh, states in the North that wanted to do away with slavery. Although, I mean, it's been made that slavery has been the overwhelming issue of that war and it was an issue. There, there was other factors uh, to be considered in there. The Spanish Civil War of 1936 was uh, driven by ideology and this involved the uh, fascists versus the communists. The fascists won with um, General Franco, Franco Franquissimo, I think his name is Franco, General Franco. Zimbabwe Rhodesian Civil War, also called the Liberation War. Um, that sort of, that wasn't really a revolution. Um, it was a, it's sort of, this one sort of blurs between a revolution and a civil war. It was an ongoing war that went on for 13 years, um, largely driven by uh, race. This one sort of had a race as a major factor and ideology as a minor factor. So you had a, a white, more or less uh, capitalist ruling structure and a black, more or less communist underclass and those two battled and, uh, and um, that went on for 13 years. The Yugoslavian civil war was an ethnic religious civil war. So you had one country that had been made up of multiple ethnicities. Uh, you had Serbs, you have Croats, Bosnians, Macedonians, and Kosovars, all these different ethnicities. You have Catholics, you have um, Eastern Orthodox religion, and you have Muslims. So you have basically a tinderbox in there, and they all went to war against each other. It was kind of a war of all against all, and they ended up with separate countries um, for for basically each ethnicity. And finally, the Ukrainian Civil War, which is sort of still going on. Um, that started in uh, 2013, <clears throat> and it pitted the largely uh, Russian-speaking um, industrialized east part of the country against the uh, Ukrainian uh, western part of the country. And it's it was it was uh, fought, they were, it's a civil war, um, but they were essentially proxies for uh, Russia and NATO, or Russia and the United States. So let's get into the meat of the subject, preconditions necessary for a revolution in the United States of America. So anytime you wanna look at something coming to pass, um, before it can, you first have to look at what are the necessary preconditions that will lead to this condition. And so today we are looking at revolution. Can we see a revolution in the United States of America within let's say the next 10 years? These are uh, very timely topics given the COVID and the um, COVID-19 and just the kind of global crisis we're seeing in virtually every country. So here are some of the preconditions that have been met. Ruling power has become fragmented or ineffectual a large degree of wealth disparity between rulers and working class, a vanishing middle class, small business owners, managers, union workers, a sense of hopelessness among the working class in particular, young males. Uh, what is missing is a unified movement in opposition to the ruling class and a galvanizing leader or figurehead for the disaffected. So <clears throat> the ruling power, condition number one, precondition number one, which has been met, ruling power has become fragmented or ineffectual. And all of these headlines I've pulled from before the coronavirus um, pandemic even started. So all of these preconditions were in place. Why exactly Congress can't agree a coronavirus bailout, they all agree needs to happen. This is the one exception. So um, they all agree a bailout needs to happen, happen but Democrats and Republicans uh, can't agree on the aid package and they're arguing over that. The US government shuts down as Congress can't agree on a spending bill. And we've seen this a few times in the last 10 or 11 years. And it was something that virtually never happened before. Uh, but the Congress just can't agree on um, any sort of, um, of their spending bills. And they, they constantly uh, shut down the, uh, the government over it. So um, politically, we are seeing a lot of um, 
uh, a lot of fragmentation, a lot of bickering. And essentially, well, you could say, yeah, these sides are always going to debate. But remember, these sides are always, they're always part of the same establishment. So they generally reach their consensus. But um, they're becoming ineffectual. And we are seeing problems also in the army. The armed forces are showing problems. Recruiting, recruiting problems historically are most acute in the army. It's considered the canary in the coal mine. Last year, the army's initial recruiting goal was 80,000 enlistees. Early in the year, that was reduced to 76,500. They ultimately enlisted 70,000, a shortfall of 7,600. Of the 70,000 recruited, 10 to 12% required waivers of existing standards. So 10 to 12% of 70,000 is another 7,000. Uh, and 1.9% were category four recruits who scored between the 10th and the 31st percentile on the Army's aptitude test. So that means they were dumb. Um, they were less effective than higher scoring recruits, thus the Army had, to quanti had a quantity and quality failure despite offering unprecedented enlistment bonuses that are disproportionately attractive to the lower socioeconomic classes. So what does that mean? Well, this is a big, big chunk that could actually form a presentation all on its own. But at a time when the US, United States of America has the largest population in its history, they can't get 80,000 enlistees. They can't get 80,000 quality enlistees. As a matter of fact, they've only been able to, they can't even get 90% uh, of that they fell short by close to 20,000. And um, not only can they not get people to come out and join the army, but the people, they have had to lower the physical standards to accept people because people can't, I don't know, they can't run a mile or they're too small or they're too fat or something. And um, they're mentally substandard as well. I mean, the army has instituted IQ tests um, for quite some time. So, and I believe, I believe it starts at 90. I believe you have to have an IQ of at least 90 to make it into the Army, the US Army. And they've, they've had these tests in place for over 100 years. So what we are seeing is that despite having the largest population they've ever had, they can't come up with capable bodies. They are getting fatter, more useless, and more stupid. So that is a bit of a problem when it comes to recruiting. Um, Desperate, and the police are also having problems as well. Desperate for recruits. More police departments are looking at non-citizens. So they just can't get enough police. And um, we're going to see, and what does this mean? This means that it begins to diminish the state's ability to project power. The state, a uh, diminished army means the state has a limited ability to project power globally. And of course, the police means they have a limited ability to enforce power locally. So precondition number two, growing wealth inequality. And here we can see the US income inequality is at its highest level in 50 years. This came out September 20th, 2019. It shows a homeless couple sleeping on the streets in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is the state with the largest homeless population in America. That's pretty disappointing, isn't it? And um, wealth inequality at the highest level in 50 years, and it's growing. And tell me, do you think the COVID-19 is going to decrease that or increase that? I mean, that's obviously going to increase wealth inequality, right? <sighs> A vanishing middle class. This is another one of our preconditions. So from June 25th, 2019, America's slowly disappearing middle class. The American middle class, once the envy of the world and the occasional object of its derision, is shrinking. The report, which looked at the U.S. and 11 Western European countries, found that in the nearly 20 years from 1991 to 2010, the portion of American adults living in middle class households fell from 62% to 59%. So some quick math tells us, um, you know, in a country of 330 million, that small fall in percentage is 10 million people. So 10 million people have slipped out of the middle class. That's a lot. And 
when they slip out of the middle class, that puts more pressure on the people in the bottom as well. Another article um, from around the same time or a little sooner says the middle class is disappearing in countries around the world and it means millennials won't have the same opportunity as their parents did. And again, I mean, this could be a whole entire subject on itself, a whole presentation or video. Um, but yeah, millennials, I mean, if you're a millennial, you know it, right? You can't, um, I mean, my parents in the 60s and the 70s, they could have one person going to work, right? At, I don't know, pick a place. They could work at a hardware store or um, even a gas station, you know? And um, they could go to work. And with that, they could afford a car, they could afford a house, and they could have a family. And the mother could choose to work or not to work, right? And, um, you know, that's no longer the case. That's, that's pretty well unheard of now. If you, that kind of arrangement now is going to put you in the lower order. You're lucky if you live in a, in a townhouse, right? And why is the middle class important? Well, the middle class the middle class tends to be the aspirational class. The middle class wants to be the upper class. The middle class is the engine. The middle class, they pay the most proportionately of taxes, or not proportionally, the, the most overall of taxes. Um, they're the ones that, you know, they're, they're in the positions of competency. They want the status quo because they're striving, but they're not reckless in their striving. You know what, they want to advance they're putting kids through college, they're working, they're dependable, uh, they're paying mortgages, they're paying bills, they're consuming products, they provide the stability to a nation. So them vanishing, that is a problem. And one interesting number here that we're looking at, this fall in uh, household income, this is um, households, not individuals. So the fact that households had fallen from 52, 62 to 59% over this 20 year period, that is actually worse than it indicates because um, probably more of those households had two income earners in 2010 than they did in 1991. And I would imagine from 2010, this number has only grown. Another precondition is a sense of hopelessness among the poor and the working class. 50 million Americans are now living in poverty. This bottom picture here, this tent city, this is in California. There's an entire tent city in California. When I was a kid, California was the place, okay? California was, uh, what would you call it now? I mean, there's nothing really comparable to California now in the um, global consciousness or even the, the American consciousness. But California was sort of like the Shangri-La, the promised land, right? You go out to California, People get good jobs, you know, or they, they're on TV or they're modeling. The weather is good all year round. You have cars, nice cars. You can cruise the beach. You know, it just, it was the dream. It was the ultimate. And now look what it's become. It's become tent city. It's become, you know, it's become impoverished. And like I said, they have the highest, um, the highest uh, population of homeless in the United States. And it's not just California. You know, we can see this in rural white areas as well and uh, urban black areas. You know, it's, it's just a growing, growing problem. But a revolution um, is missing a unified movement in opposition to the ruling class. This is what America does not have. Americans are very fractured. They're fractured along racial lines. You have um, Europeans, you have African Americans and you have uh, Hispanics or Latinos. Those are three distinct racial groups primarily, and there's others as well, of course. There's Asians and um, Asians, and of course, other, um, you know, Middle Easterners, re <clears throat> religious lines, Muslims, Catholics, Christians, Jews, uh, ethnic lines, you know, even amongst Latinos, you know, you have Mexicans and you have um, Puerto Ricans, right? Ideological lines, um, we know there's a very strong socialist contingent in the United States, there's a very strong capitalist contingent, libertarians, alt-right or dissident right, hard left, uh, there's just the entire gamut, right? And geographic, it is very hard 
I mean, remember when the um, when the colonies initially revolted against Great Britain? For one thing, they were very. It was very easy for them to be unified. They all spoke the same language. They all came from England themselves. So culturally, ethnically, racially, they were very homogenous. And geographically, um, the the original thirteen colonies, I guess it was, um, were very sort of in reasonable proximity. I mean, I know that the transportation was much more limited back then, but you know, it, it was a much smaller uh, geographic area of the United States. Now the United States goes from Alaska to Florida to Hawaii to Maine, right? So those are those are all barriers uh, to a united opposition that would overthrow our ruling class. And there is no revolutionary leader. Although several have come up to the surface, it is very clear the population wants a revolutionary leader. Barack Obama was a revolutionary leader. He had a revolutionary zeal to him. He had an appeal of breaking the status quo. <clears throat> Donald Trump, I know a lot of people really, really, really hate Donald Trump. Um, some good reasons and some for bad reasons. Nevertheless, you must remember that 60 million people voted for him. And the reason they voted for him is because he was saying to the establishment, fuck you. Donald Trump wanted to throw a stick of dynamite and blow up the establishment. At least that was his election, his campaigning rhetoric, right? That never came to pass. He's very much become just a neocon. Uh, as Barack Obama very much became just an establishment figure, and Bernie Sanders was another one. Bernie Sanders had a huge movement behind him. Uh, he wanted to take on the establishment. He wanted to take on Wall Street. But then in the 2016 election, the very the Democratic establishment said, Bernie, you're out. And he said, okay. He went along with it, right? And kind of the same thing has happened to him more or less this year. An establishment candidate, a status quo candidate in Joe Biden has become the front runner and Bernie has just dropped out. So, I mean, that says a lot about him as well. You know, he's not even willing to take on the establishment in his own party. Do you really think he's going to take on the Wall Street establishment? Donald Trump, you know, America for Americans and, you know, everything is about the dollar with him, right? Um, he just, everything is about the stock market and making the people that run off the stock market rich. He's a guy that goes right in for GDP and he thinks that solves every problem. And Barack Obama just, you know, you know, he, he said no war, started wars. I mean, he's whatever. He's kind of far in the rearview mirror now anyway. So, but anyways, all of them had, all of them appealed to a revolutionary zeal, uh, but ultimately they failed as you should expect them to because they were working within the establishment. And when you stare into the establishment, to quote, to quote Nietzsche, when you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back into you, right? And they stare into the establishment, but the establishment is staring into them. So you think that they're going to rip apart the establishment, but no, the establishment is designed to deal with these kind of threats and it takes them and molds them. So that is what is prohibiting a revolution. And here is my conclusion. <clears throat> the state itself holds considerable soft power, though this is diminishing quickly, especially in the face of the coronavirus threat. Hard power may stick around, but that's one of those tricky things that the more you use it, kind of the more it can come back on you. But in terms of soft power, moral posturing, and just getting people to go along, that's in a very tenuous position right now because, um, they're kind of screwed either way uh, with the economy and with the virus. Like if they pull out of uh, quarantining and social distancing too soon, that could lead in a spike of the viruses, which would really create a backlash. And if they leave it too long, that would lead to bankruptcy, homelessness, and all those problems, and that will come back on them. So they're really in a tough situation. The fact that there is no cohesive group, either religiously, ethnically, or ideologically, nor a unifying leader, an effective unified anti-established movement is unlikely. Therefore, I conclude that a civil war in the United States is much more likely than a revolution. So that is what I will be doing next, okay? I will be looking at the preconditions necessary for a civil war in the United States of America. Remember, hit like, hit subscribe if you want to see more of this, and I will see you very soon. Uh, how do I get out of here?